Hey everyone, I'm Brianna from Boom and welcome to Boom Chat. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Saladin Ahmed, the writer of Abbott 1973. Elena Abbott is one of Detroit's toughest reporters. And after defeating the dark forces that murdered her husband, she's focused on the most important election in the city's history. But when someone uses dark magic to sabotage the campaign of the prospective first black mayor of Detroit, it becomes clear to Abbott that the supernatural conspiracy in her city is even greater than she ever imagined. Now, Abbott must exhaust all her abilities as a reporter and a supernatural savior to rescue Detroit. But at what cost to her own life? Saladin, I'm so excited for this. Oh my goodness, thank you for joining us today. This is amazing. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm very oh. happy to be here. All I'm so excited. We get more Abbott. This is wonderful. Okay. <laughs> so I have to ask you, we all loved Abbott. Um, but what made you want to set the next story in 1973, one year later? Um, it's uh, following pretty closely on the story that uh, we began in the first volume. Um, there's some uh, really exciting energy in the city of Detroit in the early 70s. And it's a period that often gets uh, overlooked. You know, we talk about the 1967 uprising slash riots, and then people kind of fast forward over the 70s, and uh, there were still a lot of people there in Detroit doing a lot of amazing things. And so I think that's a, a, a rich kind of environment. It's also um, the sort of world that I was born into. And so it's a, it's a sort of tribute to, to kind of the era that came just before mine in that city. Is it the fact that it's a continuation that you wanted to return to the story of Abbott or what made you want to go back to her story in general? Well, I knew from the beginning uh, that um, Elena's story was going to take more than one volume to tell. Um, I think, uh, as I'm sure we'll talk about, uh, she's a character that for me resonates with a lot of different aspects of uh, the world we're dealing with today. And um, whereas the first volume was really focused on um, police brutality and journalism as a practice, um, we get a little bit more into politics and elections in this volume. And uh, I think that there's um, a series of systems that I wanna talk about with this book. And uh, um, that'll be one of them. And there, there are yet others to come. Ooh, that's so exciting. I love it. Okay. so. I'm with Abbott. I'm just, I'm so glad to see such a strong queer woman of color, which is not something that we get to see very often. And honestly, she just seems like, it, it seems like you plucked her out of like our era right now and just like dropped her in the seventies because that's just how relevant she is. What was your inspiration for her as a character? Uh well, for me, um, I've always been in love with certain kinds of genre stories. I've always been in love with stories about the kind of uh, the detective that just won't give up on on the truth, uh, on the sort of uh, character that has brushes with the occult when no one else kind of believes them. And, um, you know, these are classic genre stories. Uh, the problem, kind of as you imply, is that they always have people who look the same at the center of them, right? So we've got decades of stories about white guys being, uh, uh, getting to the truth. And to me, um, uh, when I think about my city um, that I was born in Detroit, um, it's a black city and, you know, black people are at the, at, at the center of it. Um, uh, I think that women um, have always kind of uh, had more at stake in digging out the truth than men have in certain ways. And so um, I, I think that uh, women and black people and queer people um, who are always kind of marginalized in these stories instead should, should often be at the center of stories about questing for truth or for justice or um, to protect things around them. I think that um, those of us who find ourselves in the margins actually have have to face those struggles in a much more visceral way sometimes. And so it's uh, it felt like if I was going to tell a detective story, if I was going to tell a story about a a chosen one figure because she's also a mystical figure. Um, it couldn't just be the same guys uh, getting those stories told about them. It has to be new faces and names. I, I, I really love it, Saladin, because as a Black woman myself, like knowing that there is a character who, who is special and who's smart and who's capable, like it's really great that like I get to read that story and I get to see myself and I get to see my friends and my family in it. So 
thank you for that because I'm sure there's going to be so many other people who are going to be so excited to get to see themselves in comics like I'm I'm mind blown like I loved her from the moment when I saw like number one was coming out I was just like I was like she's a strong black character this is so amazing so like honestly from the bottom of my heart thank you for this I really appreciate that. It's always, it's always the nicest and most important part of the gig to me to talk to folks who are like, oh, we didn't have this before and now we have this. And, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, 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 you know, I'm not black, I'm not a woman, but I'm, I'm an Arab Muslim man in America. I'm sharply aware of how it feels to not have the same toys that other people get to play with, you know, and, uh, and, and the same myths that other people get to tell. And so, um, you know, we gotta, we gotta spread that around. I love it. And thank, thank you for adding, adding to the um, mass of information and stories and things that we get to have. It's so great. And it's so good. It's just so good, Saladin. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I just, I love when I get to, to talk to creators and gush because I'm just like, I, this is it, just, thank you. Um, okay. So back to, back to the important stuff. In Abbott, there are some seriously nefarious forces at work here. What kind of research did you do on magic and the occult for this story? And are they based in anything or is it something that's kind of your own making? Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of an original mythology. So Abbott, at the Abbott's uh, main opponent sort of or main adversary throughout the series is a, is a force really more than a, than a being called the Umbra. And it's a, it's a sort of shadowy force of darkness that is um, <clears throat> threatening her city, perhaps the world. And uh, we get the sense that it's been around for a very long time and there have always been those who have kind of manifested to fight it. Um, and so it's a very classic story of kind of eternal evil and a champion that, that, that challenges that evil. But for me, um, you know, I always want to ask what what does evil mean, right? Um, uh, and so I connected the Umbra to very real world forces that that represent evil. I think in 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 the world we live in, right? Brutality, um, <clears throat> greed, bigotry, and uh, and those forces. I think um, I, I I basically turned them into literal monsters. And uh, um, as far as the magical kind of DNA of uh, of the story, I, it's a mishmash. Um, it's there's a lot of different stuff in there. I love ritual. I love monsters. In the in the first volume of Abbott, we had sort of mythological monsters like a centaur and, uh, and a minotaur and things, um, but a horrific version of these things. Um, and in this version, we have um, sort of um, magic that feels a bit more like spells being cast, and we have a figure. Um, who's a bit more of a subtle player with uh, with magic rather than just uh, throwing monsters at her. I love all that stuff. I mean, uh, I'm an old D and D nerd, so getting into the systems of magic and all that stuff is 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 something that thrills me. But um, what I really wanted to have at the center of this is the sense that because to me this is how evil really works in the world, that that evil is about drawing power from from other people without them giving it up, right? Like it's stealing power from other people, right? Mm -hmm. And so literally some of the monsters in Abbott have been exploited people in the city who, who've been turned into to creatures in the first volume. And now in the second volume, we're gonna find in 1973, we're gonna find that the city of Detroit itself is a source of power. And um, uh, we get into some stuff about ley lines and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, so the details are always fun to me about magic systems, but they they're always in service of kind of what does magic mean for for this world and what does you know what does power mean in this world and so Abbott's got some very real world lessons about that even as we get into all the ritual spooky stuff. Oh I love that I love it when you can tell that somebody has done the research about the way that certain magical things work I'm so excited to see where this goes I, I can't wait. Okay so real real talk um, the release of this story is very timely with the presidential election and the electing of the first black senator in Georgia. How do you feel about Abbott lining up with real world events? Kind of. Well, you know, it's funny because the, the, there was a degree of that with uh, the first volume as well, which kind of lined up with Black Lives Matter, um, uh, getting a lot of prominence 
and talking about police brutality. And, and now it's, a, it's electoral politics. And to some degree, it's been coincidence of timing that like, you know, I've told these, written these stories however many months ahead of time and they've kind of come out just as certain issues have come really blazingly to the front pages. But really what that signifies is not that I'm any, you know, kind of, uh, uh, profit or anything, just that certain problems don't go away in America. You know, I mean, when I talk to um, Detroiters, Black Detroiters who are dealing with this stuff in the 70s, it's, there's, there are so many echoes uh, that just sound the same. Propaganda about the election, uh, trying to scare people about um, basically about Black people taking over and communists taking over, right? Um, uh, the kind of the, the specific sorts of lies, the specific sorts of appeals to people's fear, um, they're, they're, and tampering with elections, all of it is, is just, um, you know, it's a, a story that's sort of on repeat in America. And so part of, I guess, what I'm trying to show is that fact, right? That if it looked like this in the 70s and it looks like this now, um, you know, maybe stuff hasn't changed as much as we hope it has. Yeah, it, it all just seems to keep happening the exact same way with the exact same warnings. And are we going to listen this time? I, I hope we listen. I hope we, we take heed because we, we know what happens. Like we, mm -hmm. we know what can happen and it can be really scary or everybody can step up and do the right thing. And, you know, I think that part of what I want to show, um, uh, with this series in general is that that can happen, right? And there there was a moment, just like in Reconstruction, there was a moment um, where it seemed like the country was going to sort of try to get its stuff together despite the objections of a pretty big racist uh, <laughs> chunk of people. Um, uh, the early 70s really was like that. We talk a lot about like the change of the 60s, but it was really like the, the first couple years of the 70s that people were making radical movement to like put black leaders in the cities, genuinely empower communities that have been sort of uh, denied that, um, really try and address kind of uh, electoral fraud, all of that stuff, um, make Jim Crow, you know, uh, more than just a uh, obsolete name, right? And, and try and actually integrate. All that stuff was really happening in the, in the early 70s in full force. And so it was a, period of radical progressive change that, that we just then backtracked on pretty quickly. So I think I kind of want to remind folks that when this stuff happens in cycles and that it doesn't have to be uh, unrelenting darkness, I guess. Yeah, I mean, you know, my folks grew up in that time and my dad said, right after um, the Civil Rights Act was passed, it actually kind of got worse for everybody because it was like, mm. oh, we have to be nice. Well, now we're not going to be nice. and. Mm. You can just see how things just can go sideways really quickly. But this is, I'm really glad that there's a spotlight for this. And I'm really glad that it's opening the door to have the conversation about these types of things because it's really important. And we really have to know where we come from so that we don't make the same mistakes again. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, again, thank you for telling these beautiful stories that are just, it's, you, you did great, Saladin. Like, I just, oh. I, I love it so much. Like, she's, she's one of my absolute favorite characters and she's just like my hero. So I, I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I know that this is a very strange pivot and I am sorry for the weirdness of the pivot, <laughs> but Abbott and Amelia get a dog. Yes, they do. Okay, yeah. you have to tell me, is the dog okay? Does the dog make it through volume two? I, I refuse to disclose that. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> Everybody was mad at me because I killed a horse in the first volume. So I, I will say I did take that warning to heart, but uh, so, but, um, but you know, I don't want to give away anything, so. Okay, okay, fine. But I also saw on Twitter that you have a dog. <laughs> Can you can yeah. you tell me can you tell us everything about him? <laughs> Let's see if he'll he'll come to the hey buddy. Oh yeah, I know big guy. Oh there we go. <laughs> this is Rocket. He just got Rocket. woken up in his bed. Yeah. Hi, honey. And Rocket is wasn't supposed to be a quarantine dog. Um we just happened to get him like the week before everything went crazy. And uh so he's become a quarantine dog. He's very, very attached because oh, he's always baby with bean. Me, so. He's going, 
down by my feet now. But um, yeah, it's funny um, because I gave them a dog because I wanted a dog <laughs> mm-hmm. and I didn't. Um, that first issue was actually written a, a, quite a while ago um, uh, before quarantine and just everything, you know, everything was so wacky with um, with schedules and stuff that um, it, it happened to be written a, a good bit before the rest of the issues. And uh, yeah, I didn't have a dog yet. I think that was like my wish fulfillment. <laughs> <laughs> and, I love and, it. Now I have one. Hey, Manifestation. Man. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's fantastic. Well, I am so excited for all of the issues that are coming out for 1973. Saladin, thank you so much for your time today. It has been an absolute joy chatting with you. And for those of you all watching at home, be sure to pick up a copy of Abbott 1973 number one in stores now. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.